In this video, we will take a look at a few key properties of moving average models. These are also called MA models and the simplest MA model is one which chooses to work with a single lagged value of the shock. This model is also called the MA1 model and its specification goes something like this. The level of your time series denoted by Y for this period T is simply equal to a constant mu plus theta times the shock in the previous period, let's call it epsilon T minus 1 plus the shock in the current period, let's call it epsilon T. Okay, I can think of these epsilons to be essentially white noise, which means that their expected value is a zero. Their variance is a constant, let me call it sigma squared, and these epsilons, they are serially uncorrelated. Which means, for any two periods, T and S, the covariance of epsilon T and epsilon S will be equal to zero. Okay? I can take the specification for MA1 and I can extend this model by not only working with a single lagged value of the shock, but this time working with many more lagged values. And this will give me the higher order MA model, which is also called the MAQ model. In a MAQ model, we, we are working with essentially Q lagged values of the shock. The specification reads as Yt is equal to the constant mu plus theta 1 times the shock one period ago plus theta 2 times the shock two periods ago all the way till theta q times the shock q periods ago and then not to forget the shock for the current period epsilon t okay so we have now the formulations the model specifications for ma1 and for ma q Let's do this. Let's focus on MA1 and let's try and intuitively understand the importance of these two parameters, mu and theta. For this purpose, what we've done here is that we have plotted two sample paths which come from two different MA1 models. Okay, the blue path it comes from a MA1 model that chooses mu to be equal to 0 and theta to be equal to 0.2. The red path, it comes from a MA1 model which chooses again mu is equal to 0 but theta is equal to 0.95. Okay, both these paths, please remember, they are being fed the same epsilons, the same shocks. Okay, so what differentiates the blue path with the red path or from the red path is the value of theta. Okay, mu is the same and all the shocks going into the two paths, they are also the same. Okay, so very quickly, eyeball these paths and tell me what do you observe. You should observe actually three things. Number one, even though the blue and the red parts, they have markedly different values for theta, still these parts, they are not very different from each other. That's the first thing for you to observe. The second thing for you to observe is that both these parts, they seem to be centered around the same value and this value is precisely zero. Okay, which coincides with the value of mu that we've chosen to work with. So it's telling me that mu as a parameter plays the role of the mean of our time series. If our time series follows a MA process or a MA model. Okay, then the third thing for you to observe is that the red path it seems to have a higher variability, a higher dispersion around this mean of zero, which tells me that higher is the value of theta, higher is the variability of my time series. Okay, so choice of theta impacts the variability of my time series yt about this mean value. Okay, now 
Let's do this. Let's repeat the same experiment that we are doing here. And this time, let's choose theta to be 0.95 for the red path and theta to be minus 0.95 for the blue path. Okay, so what do you observe now? Well, in this situation, again, it's the case that the two parts, they are centered around this value of 0, which is my chosen value of mu. But this time, these parts are not as similar to each other as was the case when theta was 0 0.95 and 0 0.2. Okay, these parts, they look quite different from each other. The biggest difference that you can spot is that the red path, which works with a positive value of theta, seems to have more persistence as compared to the blue path, which works with a negative value of theta. Look at this time region, for example. For this time region, see, the red path, when it deviated away from the mean value of zero, it stayed deviated away from zero for a longer period of time. During the same period of time, look at the blue path. It's crossed the value of zero many more times. Okay, so this is telling me that the higher persistence shown by the red path is actually because of the positive correlation between successive values of my time series when it comes to this red path. And that happens because of the positive value of theta that this path works with. The, the blue path, it seems to have a negative correlation between successive values of my time series. And this negative correlation comes up because of the negative value of theta that this path chooses to work with. Okay, so using these paths, we now have a very broad idea of the role that mu and theta, these parameters, play. Okay. Let's very quickly now take a look at the first two moments of yt, I mean the mean and the variance, if yt follows a moving average model. If I were to start off with MA1, based on this model specification and based on this fact that these epsilons have a zero mean or expected value, it quickly tells me that the expected value of yt should simply be equal to this mu. Okay. Also, I know this that these epsilons, they have the same variance of sigma squared and these epsilons, they have a zero covariance, which tells me that the variance of yt, if it follows this MA1 process, is simply theta squared, this times sigma squared plus sigma squared, which simplifies to this guy, sigma squared times one plus theta squared. Okay, moving on to MAQ, again, I can easily reason this out that the expected value of yt is mu and I can reason this out that the variance of yt is simply sigma squared plus theta 1 squared sigma squared plus theta 2 squared sigma squared all the way till theta q squared sigma squared. Okay, this is what I get for the variance of yt if it follows the maq model or the maq process okay now let's move on to covariance stationarity please note this that when it comes to moving average models these models they are covariance stationary by design which means that you don't have to check for covariance stationarity based on your choice of model parameters Irrespective of the model parameters that you choose to work with, moving average models or let's say moving average processes, they are covariance stationary by design. Okay, next let's now talk about autocorrelation. So autocorrelation for a time series is basically the correlation between yt and let's say its value h periods ago. That was yt minus h. So correlation between yt and y t minus h is called the autocorrelation for a lag or displacement h. Okay, autocorrelation function, it basically tells us how autocorrelation varies with respect to the lag or displacement. 
A very distinctive feature when it comes to moving average models is that their autocorrelation function, it cuts off or let's say abruptly decays down to a zero for any chosen lag that is greater than the order of the model. Okay, which means that for the MA1 model, for any lag or displacement which is greater than 1, which is the order of this model, the autocorrelation would have abruptly decayed down to a 0. Okay, for MAQ, for any lag or displacement which is greater than Q, the autocorrelation would have abruptly decayed down to a 0. Okay, very quickly, let's observe this particular fact by taking a look at a couple of example plots. This is the plot for the autocorrelation function of a MA1 model and this is the plot for the autocorrelation function of a MA2 model. For this plot, we observe that for lag 1, the autocorrelation is non-zero. It's significant. But for any lag which is greater than 1, the autocorrelation has abruptly decayed down to a zero. Right? For all these lags which are greater than 1, all these autocorrelations that have been estimated, all these autocorrelations, they are broadly speaking within these confidence bands that we have drawn, which means all these autocorrelations are non-significant. Okay? Coming to this plot, which is for MA2, the first two lags, they have a significant, a non-zero autocorrelation. All other autocorrelations for lags which are greater than 2, which is the order of this process or model, the autocorrelations, they have decayed down to a 0. They have become non-significant. Okay? Then, very quickly, let's note down the formula for the autocorrelation for lag 1 for the MA1 model. And the formula is autocorrelation for lag 1 is equal to theta divided by 1 plus theta squared. This formula very quickly confirms what we saw for our sample parts. And that is, the sign of this autocorrelation depends on the sign of theta. When theta is positive, you have a positive autocorrelation, which implied a higher level of persistence. And for negative theta, we have a negative autocorrelation, which implied our path crossing over the mean level much more often. Okay? Next, let's now move on to partial autocorrelation, which is the correlation between yt and let's say its lagged value or let's say its value h periods ago, yt minus h, after accounting for the lags which sit in between yt and yt minus h. I mean, after accounting for y t minus 1, y t minus 2, all the way till y t minus h plus 1. Okay? Now, unlike the autocorrelation function, please remember this, that for moving average processes, the partial autocorrelation function, it decays, yes, but it decays gradually to 0 as the lags keep increasing as h keeps increasing. Okay? So, the decay down to a zero, it happens gradually. The pattern of this decay, whether it is one-sided or whether it is oscillatory, depends on the choice of your parameters. Okay? Let's take a look at a couple of example plots. This is for MA1. This is for MA2. For both these models, you observe this, that the partial autocorrelations, they are decaying down to a zero and the profile is an oscillatory kind of profile. Okay? The decay is not abrupt. It's gradual decay down to a zero as the lag keeps increasing. Okay? The last aspect for us to cover in this video is this aspect of invertibility. Please note this, that invertibility is all about being able to invert the moving average model that is given to us and express yt not in terms of lagged values of shocks, but in terms of lagged values of y itself. 
okay this version of any given moving average model which expresses yt in terms of its own lagged values this version is called the auto regressive version okay and being able to invert any given moving average model and get its auto regressive version is only possible if this condition is satisfied okay if you remember i had said that a moving average model is covariance stationary by design irrespective of your chosen model parameters but please note this that a moving average model is not invertible by design based on the parameters that you've chosen invertibility has to be checked okay now let's focus on this condition which is the required condition for invertibility well for this condition what we have done is that we have taken this specification which is for maq and we've written this specification slightly differently we've taken the mu to the left hand side and we've written down these lagged values of these shocks using what is called the lag operator you can think of this lag operator l to be some kind of a backward shift operator okay l applied to epsilon t gives you its value one period ago and that was epsilon t minus 1 l applied to epsilon t twice gives you its value two periods ago and that was epsilon t minus 2 and so on okay so if you were to express these lagged values of epsilon using the lag operator gather all the terms together like this what you get is what is called the characteristic polynomial of your moving average model this is your characteristic polynomial okay now for the model to be invertible it has to be true that all the roots of this characteristic polynomial i mean those values of l which make this characteristic polynomial equal to 0 all these roots should lie outside the unit circle which means that each of these roots should have a modulus of greater than 1 okay this video was all about understanding the key properties of moving average models